I'll introduce our speakers and our session for today. So thank you again for coming along. Really delighted to be hosting today's um, session, looking at um, looking at cooperative movement really and kind of where that alignment might be with the social enterprise sector, um, trying to understand kind of where the similarities are. Obviously, some co-ops are very much social enterprise organisations, but we have certainly a lot in common. Um, so I'm really delighted. We've got a great panel again today. Um, we're going to be joined and starting off our session, first of all, by hearing from uh, James Wright from Cooperatives UK. So uh, James is going to start our session for today before we hand over to Neil Cuthbert from uh, Public Affairs Cooperative. And then we always like to have someone who um, is a practitioner on our session. So I'm really delighted to welcome Lucinda from the Media Co-op. Some cheery little waves. It's going to be a great session. Um, those of you who are obviously based in Scotland will also know here in Scotland we have uh, Cooperatives Development Scotland and while it's unfortunate they weren't able to join this session it might be something we come back to and have them on a future session but I, I didn't want you to not know that for those of you who are in Scotland as well there is very specific um, advice that's also out there if you're looking to go down the cooperatives route as well as obviously um, I guess what James is going to be talking about in terms of Cooperatives UK as well so there's with, it, with every webinar we run, there's always so much support, information and advice out there. So I um, really encourage you to look up those links. I think Duncan's going to share a link to Co-ops Development Scotland as well in the chat as we go through. So we'll kick off today's session. Um, you haven't come to hear me, so we'll, we'll kick off and we'll go straight into hearing from James from Cooperatives UK. So welcome, James, and thank you. Okay. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me along. I'm just going to share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yep. Yep, okay, fantastic. Okay, so I'll start off with, I'm just gonna give some general context. Um, so Monday, uh, Cooperatives UK published our annual um, report on, on the, the cooperative economy in the United Kingdom. Um, and from a, a Scottish context, talk, that, that shows us that there are 586 independent cooperatives in Scotland at last count, um, an increase from 2019 to 2020 of just around 2.5%. Um, combined annual turnover of the Scottish cooperative economy of 1.58 billion, and 2020 a slight increase of 2.97%, considering the year uh, 2020 wasn't, wasn't great in, in many regards, that, that's not bad. Um, and new starts in cooperative over 2020 was 26. Um, and again, considering um, what was going on last year, that's that's not bad either. I would just say that um, usually we find that Scotland punches well above its weight when it comes to the number of, of, of new start cooperatives in proportion to its size compared to other parts of the United Kingdom. And I'll come on a little bit to why that might be the case later. Um, so 586 Scottish cooperatives most of those meet most standard definitions of social enterprise. Um, when we're talking about cooperatives and social enterprise, I think I tend to talk about a cooperative approach to social enterprise. That's one that's democratic, collaborative, and um, distributive by design, sharing power and wealth. Um, as well as the normal uh, cooperative economy uh, data uh, that we released on Monday this year, we also published some research findings on how the cooperative model has performed over the course of the COVID pandemic. And there's really, really encouraging signs in that data. Uh, for example, that cooperatives were four times less likely to close over the course of 2020 uh, than businesses generally. Um, this is UK wide data, but I think it would apply as much to Scottish cooperatives as to, as to, as to others. Scottish cooperatives will have, will have featured in, in, in the data sample. Um, we found that cooperatives uh, are very ambitious and, and indeed small cooperatives are markedly more ambitious than, than small businesses generally, um, which is interesting. I think that that's, I think that might come as a surprise to some policymakers in terms of where they put their focus in terms of business and wanting to support businesses with growth, scaling, development ambitions, et cetera. We also found that amongst those cooperatives who had ambitions to scale or develop their impact before COVID, 73% um, of those cooperatives retain those growth ambitions after COVID and 15% are actually more ambitious. So it's a really encouraging stuff there in terms of ambition. Um, 
the, the research findings also show us that the cooperative model has been pretty effective in dealing with the pandemic. So 92% of cooperatives told us that they could identify clear benefits of the model in dealing with the challenges of COVID over the past year or so. Um, and that's rising to 96% amongst worker and freelancer cooperatives. And we've also found in the data some interesting signs that different types of cooperative perform as well against their purpose in, relation, in response to COVID. So for example, worker cooperatives were markedly more likely to identify their ability to protect worker well-being over the course of the pandemic, consumer and community cooperatives more likely to identify having a pool of uh, customers, a community who they could draw on, whose needs they could respond to as, as a key benefit of, of their model. So there's some encouraging stuff there in terms of the latest data. Um, we also looked at what the business support needs of cooperatives might be. Um, so in terms of cooperatives who had ambitions to scale or grow, most commonly identified business support needs were things like business strategy, capital raising, and a group of things which all together you might call organisational development. Now these are all areas where cooperatives have quite a distinctive approach um, and where they need business support that caters to the, those distinctive approaches. Now at the moment, um, Scottish Government does some excellent focus. So for example, they um, focus very much on startups and they focus very much on community cooperatives. Um, and whilst that's great, it means that all those existing cooperatives out there and it's got the 500 odd you know, existing cooperative businesses in Scotland don't currently really receive through Scottish government the types of business support that cater to their particular needs in areas like capital raising, business strategy, et cetera. And this is somewhere where we really hope that the coming um, initiatives coming out of the uh, Social Enterprise Action Plan uh, that Scottish Government published just before the election could make a big difference. And we also think that, for example, the Scottish National Investment Bank could potentially play a greater role in providing some of the um, access to finance that, that cooperatives need, particularly in relation to things like, like equity investment. Um, so one example where I think Scotland is currently really leading the way uh, in terms of uh, cooperative social enterprise is um, in relation to community cooperatives. Um, so when we're talking about community cooperatives, we're talking very much about democratic social enterprise existing for the benefit of their community, uh, empowering the members of the community to, to create their own social value. This is somewhere where um, Scotland definitely leads the way um, punching well above its weight in terms of its, its size in, in, in proportion to the rest of the UK in terms of take up and use of community shares. That's the graph you can see on, on top left there. Um, what we find uh, is that you know, community shares is really a proven means for people to pool resources, mobilise financial capital, mobilise social capital at the same time to get things done. Some research we published at the back end of last year with the help of Community Shares Scotland and a number of uh, really impressive um, community cooperatives in Scotland demonstrated that using community shares helps to create very effective, financially robust and resilient social enterprises. Um, and the fact that Scotland is leading the way in this regard is, is, is really encouraging and really means that the Scottish social economy, um, the cooperative part of the Scottish social economy is, uh, is on good track. Um, but having said that, I think there are some areas where, where Scotland could do better. Uh, and where at the moment it's potentially missing out. Um, just give us an example there, top left uh, is housing. Um, so housing cooperatives, uh, you know, especially I think in the private, the private sector, provide um, really unrivaled, provide for, you know, private rental tenants, really unrivaled affordability, um, security, control, community, um, that huge social value there, I think at the moment. Um, and whilst there are some great housing cooperatives in Scotland, uh, particularly in the social rented sector, they're decades old. And you know what we are seeing you know, interesting new things happening um, in cooperative and community-led housing in other parts of the United Kingdom. We're not really seeing that in Scotland at the moment. So that, that's one area where you know, cooperatives can have huge social impact, but we're not necessarily seeing that coming through at the moment. That's something we really want to work to change. Top left there, you will see um, the famous Babs McGregor. 
um, from uh, a worker cop in uh, the east end of Glasgow uh, called Green City Whole Foods. Now, worker cooperatives exist to provide uh, you know, empowering, well-being, enhancing livelihoods. And in an era of working poverty, insecurity, precarity, you know, that social mission is, is so relevant and so important. Um, at the moment, new worker and freelancer cooperatives in Scotland are something of a rarity. Um, and we hear often from the worker cooperative community that they, they sometimes feel excluded from some of the support that's out there for businesses generally and for, for social enterprise in particular, and perhaps falling between the gap there between the two. Um, we're also seeing in other parts of the United Kingdom real growth in what we call hybrid cooperatives. So these are cooperatives which might combine elements of a worker cooperative model, but also elements of a community cooperative model existing to empower and benefit workers, but also at the same time existing to empower and benefit the community or service users, etc. The example we have there bottom left is Equal Care Co-op, which is a fast growing um, care provider in West Yorkshire, where the providers of the care those in receipt of care and volunteers from the community are all members of, of the cooperative and playing an active role in its development. Um, this hybrid model, I think, has huge potential. We're not really seeing growth of, of hybrid cooperatives in, in, in Scotland at the moment. Um, and the bottom right there uh, is Crystallizer, which is an example of a, I suppose, proto-platform cooperative. This idea of ethical, democratic, socially purposed digital platforms has been around for a while. Uh, potential, I think, for social value and social impact is huge there, both in terms of enabling social action, but also just having, having better platform businesses, to be honest, less exploitative, less extractive, that type of thing. Um, at the moment, we are working, uh, Cooperatives UK is working for our Unfound Accelerator programme with six uh, proto-platform cooperatives, uh, which Crystallizer is, is one. Um, none of those are Scottish, and there isn't, we're not really... And the work that we're doing in, in the tech community and with people interested in building uh, cooperative platforms, cooperative tech, we're not really finding much, much interest or, or much activity in Scotland at the moment in that area. Um, which I think, you know, so the, these are areas where I think we're, you know, the potential for social impact is, is huge, but at the moment, some pivotal cooperative models are not really not really developing in Scotland in the way that they, they could be, in the way that they are elsewhere. And I think what we would really need to see is for more Scottish social entrepreneurs to be exploring a cooperative approach to social enterprise, you know, an approach that's democratic, collaborative, distributed by design, as a matter of course. Um, and I think we would really like to see more of these pivotal models, so housing cooperatives, worker cooperatives, hybrid cooperatives, platform cooperatives, featuring in the, in the, in the thinking of, of people who are developing the, the social economy in Scotland, not least Scottish government. So they, as I said, they do some excellent things in supporting the development of community cooperatives and community shares, but that's a very narrow focus. I think there are other pivotal uh, cooperative models that could provide huge social impact, which at the moment um, they're not really focusing on, and that's why we're not really seeing them coming through. Um, so I think what, just to sum up there really, I think some excellent stuff happening in Scotland, um, some really established social enterprise cooperative model is doing great things, but there's huge potential to do more. And I think our hope is that things like the social enterprise action plan could be an opportunity to, to unlock some of that. Um, I will leave it there. Thank you, uh, James, for that. It was a, a great oversight, and I've already noted a few questions and thoughts down myself as you were going through your presentation. And I think it's interesting as well doing that reflection and um, in terms of the COVID and how that's kind of come through in terms of some of the data you found in the co-op movement. And I'm sure we'll come back to that in the Q and A. Um, I'm not going to go into questions straight away, but I'm um, going to go straight into inviting Neil in as our next speaker. Um, Delighted to welcome Neil, and I think I'm going to be scrolling through Neil's slides for him. So I'm just going to bring get those ready, and when you're when you tell me, Neil, I can bring them up. Yep, just go for it. Let's start. Yeah, if you can go back to the first one. Um, yeah.
Yeah, okay, well, first of all, thank you very much um, for, for inviting me um, here today. Um, I've, I've done a short presentation, which I have to say I didn't speak to James about in advance, but we do, um, does talk about sort of housing and a bit of heritage, and I guess a little bit of what Scotland's been doing in the past in terms of um, cooperatives, but, but looking at what we do and then the, the type of thing that we could be doing um, more in the future. So if we could have the next slide, please. I've always wanted to say that we, we spend a lot of time hosting webinars, actually, so I, I don't get much of a, an opportunity to do that. So, yeah, I, I just thought I'd um, you asked a little bit for, for the inspiration. And, um, you know, this is maybe just me. I'm interested in, in history. But it really strikes me that there's a really, really significant cooperative heritage in Scotland, but particularly in Edinburgh. And as you walk around the city, you know, you literally see the heritage in stone. Um, the, the images on the left, um, some of you, uh, you know, we'll recognise this if you, if, you, if you stay in Edinburgh. This is what's called, what they call now the Edinburgh Colonies housing. Um, but it was actually built in the 19th century and it was a cooperative. The, the pictures actually show the plaques because when they built these houses, um, what they did was they always put up a, a sort of plaque saying who'd built it. And it always says the Edinburgh Cooperative Building Society. There's a name of the particular manager who does it. I think he must have been very keen to see, to see his, his name in stone. But this was this was all built about the 1860s, 1870s, right up to the sort of First World War. And it's quite an interesting story. It started with um, a group of builders, basically stonemasons and other people, joiners who had been locked out because of a strike. And then they went and, and formed their own company. And then because they saw that there was a need, um, you know, in society at that time, there's a lot of poor housing. They wanted to produce good quality housing that was you know suitable for working people, basically. So the Edinburgh colonies, you probably know, they're, they're all over the city. The name colonies comes out of because they were colonising outer parts of the cities. There's some in Stockbridge, there's some beside um, Haymarket Station. But they, they built these houses and they actually sold them to um, people, so they weren't rented out. Now, they cost when they were sold about £130, which was probably a reasonable amount of money, but they also had um, ways that they could finance it. So £130 for three-bedroom house. They're now selling, as I walked around and took these pictures, there's one for sale, so it offers over £380,000, so probably going to go for north of £400,000. So you can see how it's really, really gone up in value. Um, all, none of the, all of the houses that were built in the 19th century are still there. You know, that's a testament to the quality. So Anyway, the, that's the, the cooperative building society. The other picture is, is Loudons. This is the, well, it's now Loudons, which is now a cafe. That's actually the old headquarters of um, what became ScotMed, the St. Cuthbert's um, Cooperative Society. And again, it's worthwhile checking out this building because you can see all the, 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 um, the plaques outside. And actually the name of this presentation, Cop Cooperation is, is for the welfare of all. It's actually in, in the middle of the building, you can see quite a big plaque just above the second floor. And, and it's up there. So I, I guess what, what has always inspired me was I think Scotland has got a really, you know, significant cooperative heritage, but it's not always reflected in the, in the present day. And I think James was talking about that a little bit, how in other parts of the UK, there's, there's more movement towards cooperative housing models. And, and I think what really strikes me is that Scotland was able to do this in the past, but we're not particularly doing it now. And, I, and, and why is that? And I think slightly it's because cooperatives have almost been written out of history. So if you look at the, um, you know, the colonies housing that I talked about, we call that colonies housing. We don't actually call it cooperative housing, but given that it was a cooperative um, society company that built them all, they're all still there. They were built for working people. I think actually we should probably have a bit of a campaign to call this um, cooperative housing. But anyway, there we go. That's something for something else. So if we could have the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, after having an interest in this for quite a long time, decided to do our, our own little thing, which was to form Public Affairs Cooperative in 2013. Myself and two other directors you know, set that up and, and, and we're still working there. Um, basically, we wanted to create a different type of public affairs, public relations agency. And we, we thought that the cooperative model was the one that was most aligned with our values. We did you know, quite a lot of thinking about this. We didn't we wanted to start a business, but we wanted to start a business that was slightly different. We we're also, you know, aware that there are lots of sort of ethical considerations around um, lobbying, but also, you know, public relations, etc. So I think that the 
the cooperative model has um, high values and, and, and high sort of ethical standards at its heart. So that was one of the ones that, that was one of the reasons that we wanted to get involved with that. Third bullet point, cooperatives UK were key to getting us established. I mean, I have to say that if you're thinking about setting up a cooperative, it is quite a challenge. Um, it's the enterprise agencies and the people in Scotland who are there to help businesses get set up don't necessarily you know, recognize it. It's not something that they've been used to particularly helping with. And what we found was that Cooperative UK has fantastic information on their website and really, really practical stuff. They had, a, um, still do have a, have a sort of legal sort of help desk, legal helpline. So, so we, after looking around for quite a long time, and I think enterprise agencies are helpful, but ultimately it was Cooperative UK who really helped us get established. And you know, we are big supporters of the organization and really, really proud to work with them. So public affairs and media relations consultancy business, what we do, and we work with organizations wanting to influence government policy in Scotland and throughout the UK. And we, we found that Cooperatives is, is a great business model. It's, it's a really, really interesting field. I think as you get into it, you realize that there's there's a lot of um, you know, businesses out there who are doing you know, fantastic things. James has talked about this sort of, um, just the, the huge variety of cooperative businesses that are establishing. And I, I think there's, there's really the capacity to do more. And I think what's holding us back a little bit is just this thing about, well, just the way cooperatives are viewed. And we don't always think of a cooperative business model when we're thinking about you know, getting something established, but basically, we should and 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 just you know if, if it's something you're interested in just do it and it, and it will happen so next slide please so i wanted to i thought we would uh, you know talk a little about the history and heritage which i think is really important at the start but also i thought we'd, we'd talk about stuff that's right up to date and, and just shows that the cooperative model um, can really, really, you know, fit into the economy as, it, as, as it's moving now. This is a, a business called Charge My Street, which are members of Cooptives UK. You can have a look at their website, but effectively it's what they do is they're working with um, um, communities who want to provide electric car chargers. They, they recognise that there was a, a gap in the market because, you know, what they found was there's quite a lot of rural places that, you know, for various reasons, commercial businesses weren't interested in, in providing electric car charging. So they saw, they saw a, a gap in the market, really got involved in that. They've got funding by um, Innovate UK, which is a, a, an arm of the UK government and doing amazing work at the moment. If you look at them uh, online and on Twitter, they've been working with um, Carlisle um, City Council at the moment and are providing a big network of electric car um, charging uh, in, in that community. But, um, you know, it's, it's a cooperative business. I, I'm not sure they, how, how it works and, and, and others on the call um, probably know a bit more about it, but we've had some contact with them. Very, very impressive people. And, and I think now they've, they've got this, um, you know, funding in place that they, you, they can also sort of pull in investment, the community shares model as well. So they might be expanding throughout the UK. But again, it's the type of thing we could do in Scotland or we could get these guys involved. So in your communities, you know, if, if people are talking about electric car charging, you know, use a cooperative model, contact these guys and they can help you with it. Next slide, please. And yeah, here's something a bit closer to home. Again, TV and Electric Car Club, members of um, Cops UK. But, you know, this is the type of thing that communities are doing. We're trying to move away from sort of individual ownership of, of cars and sort of cut congestion and things like that. So this is down in the Scottish borders and um, they've established this. People can join and it's, um, you know, it, it, it's a really good facility. We've got something up in Edinburgh, but it's run by Enterprise Car Club. So you know, what, what I'm trying to say is that I think the cooperative model can work on in lots and lots of different areas of the economy. And and society and so there's no reason to to sort of not think about cooperatives and I think my advice and, and what I'd like to say is that as James said Scotland is lagging behind a little bit we'd like to get more cooperatives established if it's something that you're interested in doing there is the support out there there's lots and lots of people that you can speak to and and, and help get set up so right okay so that's my that's my timer tell me 10 minutes is up so thank you very much for having me and happy to answer any questions that you might have Thank you very much, Neil. That's, um, again, just some really, I think, useful examples there in terms of people understanding what different things and that whole range of things that co-ops are included in. And it was really helpful, I think, to have 
You talk about your experience at the start in terms of getting support on going down the co-op route, because, it, you know, I think sometimes perhaps perhaps obviously setting up a limited company is much more straightforward than any kind of social enterprise or co-op, but it's how do you get that right support at an early stage? So um, really helpful to get those pointers from you as well. And always keen to kind of hear from people in terms of why they went down a kind of co-op route. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to hand over now to our last speaker and I can see questions already starting to come through in the chat as well. So do do get your questions ready for when uh, Lucinda is um, done. I know we're going to start Lucinda with a bit of a video, if that's right. So if you just all give me a second while I just get that uh, set up and then we'll be hearing from Lucinda. Just one moment. I was about to say, don't worry, there's no panicking going on in the background at all. It's all fine. <laughs> Just one second. Okay. We're nearly there, folks. Just to add, I'd encourage people to um, fit to screen as a way to view when the video comes on. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, helpful to get that reminder. I think I'm just about to share my screen, so I think we're all set to go. So do let me know if it doesn't work, but otherwise I'll assume it's all coming through fine. Is selling second-hand clothes, our co-op supports music lessons for the local community. In our co-op, you're not a cog in the machine. We own the company. We work together, learn together, and build our business together. As a director, it feels great to be running a business where we're paying a decent rate, and our seasonal freelancers are paid the same as us. Run by the members, for the members, we have more power together. Having a say in the business makes me feel more secure. Being a member means that I have a say in which local causes we support. As co-owners, we all have different strengths and weaknesses, but working as a team, the pieces of the jigsaw just fit together. Hello, is that Mrs Jones? With the deaf community and the interpreters working together, we have a sign language service that benefits us all. We're all involved in making decisions and things are changing for the better. This is our co-op. This, this is, is our co-op. Co this is our co-op. This is our co-op. This is our co-op. This is our co-op. Anyone can join a co-op and millions of people in the UK are already members. Are you? Thanks very much, Naomi. Um, I hope you enjoyed that film and that in that 90 seconds, it gave you a little bit of a sense of the range of businesses that there are that do cooperate and some of the different motivations uh, that people have to control our own businesses as cooperatives. That short film was made by Media Co-op, where I work. Um, we kind of do what it says on the tin. We're called Media Co-op, we make media, we're a co-op. So I just wanted to say a little bit about how we started. Um, I'm one of the founders. We've been going since 2004, so it's been quite a long journey. Um, before this, I used to work uh, directing television documentaries, mostly on human rights. And I was very active in a lot of campaigning and different kinds of activism. So what happened was at the same time as I was doing television work, frequently charities would come to me because I was the only filmmaker that the individuals in the charities knew and said, please, will you make a film for us? 
And eventually the penny dropped that uh, charities, social enterprises didn't have anywhere to go to get their communications done in a way that really worked for them. There were activist filmmakers around who were making, without being rude, kind of quite grungy kind of product. And then there were corporate production houses that would make stuff that looked glossy, but they really struggled to understand um, what uh, an organization that was aiming at social change was really doing. So they didn't kind of quite get it. So um, in 2004, as I said, the penny dropped and with a bunch of mates that I knew in the industry, we set up Media Co-op. And our specialism is we only do communication, which is uh, for the third sector in the public sector, which is non-commercial and which has an ethical social purpose. And uh, our big specialism is doing participatory media. So that's where the people that, if it's a film, the people the film's about get involved themselves in making it. Anyway, that was the beginning. That's why it happened. We didn't know at the start that it was going to grow, that we would end up with um, eight members and that we'd end up doing lots of new kinds of work like animation, graphic design. Um, or that we would, if you don't mind me doing a little boast here, uh, end up winning a lot of awards and not just awards, awards from within the social enterprise movement, but awards for the quality of our work from, for example, the Royal Television Society. So at the beginning, we didn't know what was a future held for us, but we did know we needed to find a model for what kind of company to be. We were very clear we were a social enterprise with a social purpose, but we didn't know at the beginning what uh, business model was right for us. And what we landed on was the worker cooperative model. And it really, really fits us. Um, for myself in the past, I'd worked a lot for different corporate production houses as a freelancer. And I'd seen a lot of very unhappy workplaces where uh, the person who's the boss or the owner is not the same people who actually do the job. And the workers owning the company just really seem to make sense. So it very much echoes what you were saying, Neil, about the public affairs cooperative. Um, when we found this model, it really fit. One of the things that we really appreciate about it is um, the cooperative movement's been around a long time. So you're getting a model that really has got a history that's been tried and been tested and turns out to be flexible and to work for a lot of really different kinds of organizations. We were very, very drawn by the fact that it's a democratic model and that it really um, puts equality at the forefront. So in our particular co-op, media co-op, we took that to quite an extreme and we thought, how do we demonstrate to each other and to everybody we work with that everybody in the company makes an equal contribution? And we decided the best way to do it was to pay ourselves uh, the same amount of money. So we've got equal pay in quite an extreme format that uh, whether you're a kind of junior admin person or you're one of the founders of the company, we all get paid the same amount of money. So you don't have to do that when you're a co-op, but the reason I'm saying that is that because we're a co-op, because the workers make the decisions, we were able to make that kind of policy decision for ourselves. And um, it just, it makes it a very motivating place to work. And it's definitely, of all the different places I've worked, the most satisfying. So to echo what Neil said and what James has said, cooperation is a really great model. My advice is to use it, to don't hesitate. Thank you for listening and very happy to answer your questions. Thank you uh, very much, Lucinda, and apologies, I ended up showing a link that I was preparing ready, but it came through a bit too early, but um, I'll come to that when we, we're just doing some of the chat. Um, again, I wrote down lots of uh, comments and thoughts, and I can see that the chat's been really active as all of our speakers have been presenting today, so I'm going to invite uh, Neil and James back in terms of questions, and I also thought, um, obviously some of you will have seen some of the chat that's going on, but I think it's always helpful to kind of and share just some of that thoughts. I think there's, there's a real excitement, particularly around housing. And I know one of the comments I wrote down as you were speaking, Neil, you know, obviously you were talking about the colonies and the rationale when they got built. And 
I guess I, I look and I think that the cost of the £130 to the over £400,000, gee, if there's not a need for us to be looking at uh, the housing issue again on that basis, um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the time is certainly right for that. And I was reflecting a little in terms of why do we think we're perhaps a bit behind in that agenda in Scotland? And I wonder whether it's, you know, obviously some of the cities where we've got key workers particularly or people that don't have salaries but house prices are even further whether that's that's meant they're almost slightly ahead so i was going to see what do you think is perhaps some of the the reason why we're behind a little bit in some of those areas and i'll perhaps put that to james and neil as a question first is it because we don't do enough to stimulate things here or is it because perhaps the need and the demand is lagging behind slightly I'll go to James first and then Neil. Do you mind Neil if I go first? Go for it. Okay, cool. Uh, I think from my perspective, it's certainly, it's not that there's a lack of need. Um, I think it, there, are, there are definitely uh, parts of Scotland where, you know, especially in the private rental sector, you know, the rent, rent is very high, you know, issues with affordability, issues with quality, the lack of control that, that, that people feel over their housing and over, therefore over the important part of their life that comes from that. Um, it, when um, One of the most recent high profile examples in Scotland is Edinburgh Student Housing Co-op, so it's a housing co-op, a, a halls of residence essentially that, that's democratically owned and run by the students and in, in that, you know, the, 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 the student housing market in Edinburgh is, is notorious for, for being quite exploitative in a way. Um, and the, the housing co-op was able to, to, to come in and offer a, a so much more affordable alternative and not just affordable, affordable alongside a model which, which you know, which gave students a great idea of control over their housing, you know, a sense of ownership, etc. So I think it, it's not, it's not that there's a lack of need out there. Um, I think it's ultimately a lack of awareness um, because it's the idea of a housing cooperative of people coming together, perhaps in a shared housing setting or, or in individual units on a, on a, on a co-managed development and co-owning and co-managing that themselves is, is, I, I, is something which I think is just doesn't cross most people's minds. Therefore, in order for there to be demand for it or interested in it, there needs to be a proactive approach to going out there and um, you know, explaining, helping people explore, the, helping communities explore their, their cooperative options when it comes to housing. Um, that, that's something which, which at the moment isn't necessarily really, really done in any significant way. In Scotland, whereas, for example, in Wales, Welsh government spent quite a bit of money on, on that kind of awareness raising, early early stage support program, to, you know, to, to, just to help help people in communities who are thinking about housing, amongst other things, to explore cooperative options and then provide some of that specialist advice and support to get things going. And similarly, uh, similar um, activity going on in England, community led housing um, hubs as well. Um, it, yeah, so I think it, it's more about a lack of awareness rather than a lack of need. Thank you, James. That's helpful. Neil, had you got anything you wanted to perhaps add to that? No, I, I, I think James has, has covered most of the, most of the things off. I mean, um, we were um, the, the cross party group on on cooperatives that, that we we talked about a bit earlier um, has done some work on on housing cooperatives and how they could be more how how the government could do to do to do more to you know help get them established so you know and, and i think other people have put in the chat about the, the different parts of information available i see somebody said that in glasgow city council they're working to do something similar with the you know with student and um, you know housing co-op so i guess there's there's lots and lots of, of, of stuff going on and i think a, a little bit about it is I think it's about, you know, attitudes and people thinking, well, you know, is this something that we can look at? And, and also looking around the country, sorry, looking around the world and, and how in other countries, I mean, one of the things when we were doing the, the work on the, the housing cooperatives, we, we considered getting a little bit of input from um, in Sweden, for example, I think there's, there's a massive, you know, housing co-op sector. And actually the interesting thing was at the time we were taking evidence and, and we, we were, using physical meetings and we thought well we can't involve anybody from Sweden because you know we, we can't get them to Scotland and you know we can't we can't do anything online but now we'd be doing it all online and we could do that so I mean I, I, th I think from, from, from my perspective I mean I think people should just keep asking the questions and sort of saying well look th there are there are lots and lots of different models available here there's a lot of, of, of good information out there where there's you know political will and I think some of the comments in the, in the chat has been very positive 
you know, let's work with that. And, um, you know, let, let's think, see if this is something that we could um, we could work on. Finally, I just thought I'd, I'd look up, you know, you get this thing online, how much is money now? 130 £130 in 1880 is worth just over £16,000 now. So if you can imagine buying a three-bedroom house quite close to the city centre of Edinburgh for £16,000, I think that would be quite popular, but I'm not sure that we could do it. I think there'd certainly be a waiting list, Neil, and uh, it would certainly be affordable housing at that rate, I think. So, yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it, when you look back at, at some of those historical attempts and perhaps housing was viewed in a different way then, which might be quite interesting, rather than always as an, maybe it wasn't seen as an investment, but was very much just seen as housing. I, I wonder whether that will have changed it a little. I'm going to ask one more question just around the kind of, a broader theme just around how we stimulate more kind of co-op so you know what what do you think would be the kind of and I'll perhaps ask each of our panelists what would be the one key thing we could really do or that you really think should be done to stimulate um more co-ops and a growth in that kind of co-op setup if we were looking to boost that and maybe that's a tough question just in terms of asking people for one thing but Again, I'll I'll do James, but I'd, I'd love Lucinda to bring you in as well if you think there's something on that as well. So maybe James and then Lucinda and then Neil, just for that one thing that you really think would stimulate the market here in terms of co-op setup. Um, okay, for me, it's definitely around taking a proactive approach to helping social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs generally um, explore cooperative options when they're in that when they're in that kind of exploratory stage. They're thinking about setting something up. Um, at the moment, quite often, a, a cooperative model just won't, just won't be on the, on the table, won't be something that they're exploring. So getting that explored is a matter of course, um, particularly outside of the community co-op space, I think. So other so other pivotal cooperative models, for example, the workshop cooperative model, which Lucinda was talking about, having that um, explored more often as a matter of course by, by entrepreneurs, I think, would be, would be key. Thank you, James. It's interesting. I know I, I saw um, Toby from Community Share Scotland actually on our call. And I know when we've talked in the past, we often say that lots of the approaches in terms of helping people set up new social enterprises often miss out community benefit societies when actually talking about the different legal structures people can have. So I think I think there's really something in that in terms of making sure that we cover all of those approaches. Um, so, yeah, definitely something we can do more on there. Lucinda? I'd agree with what you said there, James. Um, I mean, just pretty straightforwardly, if the uh, structures that are there in place, like um, uh, Scottish Enterprise and so on, put us where we belong on an equal footing with other business models, then more people would know about uh, this option. It's pretty straightforward. And it seems to me that once people do start knowing about it, then they can see the benefits. So I don't think it's rocket science, really. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's interesting. We always end up because we want specialist support for some areas that it almost does it get sidelined as a consequence of needing specialist advice and how do we make sure it stays in the mainstream, I guess, is a big question for, for cooperatives and social enterprise more generally. Um, Neil? Um, yeah, tough question. And I'm glad that was the third person you came to bear in mind. Uh, no, I, I, I think the one thing is, I think I'd say reform procurement, because I think we've, we've talked about this, this a lot. But, you know, if you look at things like just just the example I used, time to use it, which was, you know, electric car charging points, local authorities across Scotland are just doing this at the moment. I could guarantee that probably 90, 95 percent of that will go to very, very big energy companies. You know, there's a cooperative model out there and it works. You know, why don't why aren't we? Why aren't local authorities, you know, why don't, why isn't there a system that says, you know, is there a cooperative model that benefits the community, the wider community, but also, you know, sort of um, individual parts of it that, that they use. So I think we really, really need to look at pr procurement. And I think that's maybe something that can, that can happen over the, over, over the next few years. Now we've got, you know, Scottish Parliament um, elections out of the way. So quite hopeful, but yeah, I think that's what I'd focus on. Yeah, no, as you were speaking, there's an obvious link, I think, with the whole community wealth building agenda as well that needs to be made in terms of that money going back into communities. So the, there seems to be an obvious link there. So thank you. I'm going to do a bit of a change of tack, if I may, because 
it, it's really interesting. There's quite a few people just asking some of the questions, I think, particularly to Lucinda about the kind of the equal pay option. And I think that's that's quite interesting. And, and some would say quite a bold move for a company in terms of doing something quite direct. So what would you say are the pros and cons of the approach that you've taken? Um, I saw that question earlier, what are the pros and cons? And so I've had a little time to try and think of any cons. And frankly, I haven't come up with any. I mean, obviously it means that I earn a bit less than I would do if I was working in a more uh, commercial environment, but I don't consider that a con because I've worked in more commercial environments and earned more money and been unhappy in places where the workers don't have a good relationship with each other. And um, to me, that's like not, not a very difficult um, uh, dilemma there. So I really can't think of cons. In terms of pros, masses of pros. Uh, it means that you're uh, living out your ethics. You know, if you believe that each human being is equally valuable, then in this tiny, tiny little area that we control, which is our workplace as a workers' co-op, then we live it by demonstrating. I mean, value it, money is the way we communicate value in this society. So that's how we use it. Um, it's great in terms of uh, making it really explicit to one another as a group of workers all in the same enterprise together um, that we value one another and that it doesn't um, uh, that although we're doing different things we don't all have the same job we all do different things and take on different responsibilities we all have the same responsibility as co-owners of the company we're a workers co-op we own the company together we've all taken on that shared responsibility. So to um, uh, divide the wages, just split down the middle, just seems like a very self-evidently right thing to do. And um, globally and nationally, we know that the massive uh, pay ratio gap, that's just been absolutely growing in a ridiculously exponential way over the last um, decades or so is one of the social problems um, in Scotland, in the UK, in the world. So to do something against that in the tiny area where you really have control just seems to me to be a sensible thing to do. I have to say, I, I sit there and I, it is bold. I think there are many companies that do it. And I think it's interesting that you haven't come back with a con. I just wanted to just ask, how, how have you found that in terms of obviously as you need to recruit or as, as the business has grown, does, has that meant that more people want to join you or does it mean that it's harder to attract people at the, the top end if you're in terms of competitive salary, but actually getting people in where the salaries might be slightly higher than average is much easier? Um, all I can say is that in our recruitment, we've ended up recruiting people who are really good and that we're all happy working together. Obviously, there might be people who we who never applied because the wages are too low. Um, so we've missed out on that, but I don't cry about that because I'm really happy with, with, with the extremely talented and dedicated people that we've got in the co-op. So I really meant it when I couldn't. Yeah, no, thank you. Any cons between pros and cons. Thank you, Lisa. Forgive me if I feel like I'm asking the cynic question, but I just know there'll be no, people... No, 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 it's a good question. That's that a really good it. question. Yeah, yeah, I didn't mean it in that way at all. I just meant yeah. the answer to the question is no. Yeah, no, it's it's really encouraging. And I think, like like you say, I guess if people didn't apply, joining a co-op probably wasn't the right thing for them. So, you know, it, it, it's an interesting uh, balance, I think. So thank you for your, your openness and honesty. And I'm just going to... James, is that... Because obviously you'll have a, a good understanding of... A number of co-ops is that quite a common approach amongst the co-op movement or is that still quite unique oh, i don't know whether james has lost his connection briefly uh, while well, we're waiting for james to come back yeah. i don't think it is very common but there's no reason it shan't, can't start coming become more common from now we're hoping to show that it can be done yeah, no, do you know, it would, it would actually be a fascinating session. I mean, I think it, inequality, particularly around pay and salaries. I mean, James touched in his presentation about COVID and how it's kind of impacted on, on business and how co-ops have compared. But inequality has certainly been something that has been highlighted even more so, I think, in the last year. Um, 
So yeah, I think maybe maybe we do a, a particular session just on that because I think it's a really interesting uh, topic. I'm just looking through. Can, the, I, can I come in if James is? is yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I was just going to say. I mean, on the on the subject about you know, I'm glad somebody asked the question. I think just to add to what Lucinda said. I mean, as a business, you know, what we do is, and this is what you can do when it, you're you're a co-op and you're all owners effectively. You know, we just all sit down and say, well, okay, how are we going to run this? You know, how are we going to do it? So you just make the decision yourself, which is quite, um, you know, which is quite liberating, I think, as, as, as has been talked about. But I was going to say the other, you know, one of the other aspects of, of we took a decision that as a business, we were going to be, you know, totally open and upfront about um, pricing. Um, a lot of PR agencies um, aren't. So basically, you know, you look on their website and, they don't give any sort of information away. Now that's totally up to them. It's it's a decision that they take. But I can think of only other one company based in Edinburgh that is actually like us, open and transparent, and puts it on the website. So that is there's two sides of the coin. I think there's there's sort of being open and transparent about pricing, and I think that reflects corporate values. And you know the other thing is as as Lucinda said is about you know remuneration of um you know staff. So you know we, we we've tried to add that in as well and it's just something that makes it a bit different but i think it's you know as i say it aligns with the values and it's a good thing to do yeah and actually someone's put in a really useful link in the in the chat as well about um, food co-op suma um taking that approach as well so there's obviously there are companies out there that do it and that, i think the comment that's in the chat that you'll have all seen is you know how to fix the gender pay gap we know that um <laughs> gender race all of these issues get talked about in terms of equal pay so i guess yeah there's your solution um you you would spend a lot less time researching and writing reports on what the difference was i guess if uh, everyone was paid the same um i'm just going to come to just some other questions that have come through one's just about um collaboration perhaps a little bit more so do we sometimes end up drawing too many distinctions between social enterprise and and the cooperative movement and how do we build more collaboration between the two and where do you see that alignment and i'll perhaps again while you're back james and you've got a good connection i'll i'll bring you in first if i may um okay i mean there's already i think there's already a lot of collaboration across over so i think particularly community shares community ownership that that type of thing obviously that's Huge growth in cooperative community-owned forms of social enterprise. Um, a lot of the organisations that that are involved in supporting community businesses and community shares, community ownership, are very much part of the broader social economy landscape. Um, I suppose that the distinction for us is, is not necessarily about whether it's social purpose, because lots of cooperatives have social purpose. It's just the degree to which the organisations have a democratic governance structure and and have that kind of empowerment of, of beneficiaries at, at the core of what they do um so you know we, we we would love to see i'm sure that people in the social enterprise community social enterprise scotland would, would love to see more cooperatives be clearer and more forthright about their social purpose and lots of people in the cooperative movement across the uk would like more social enterprises to become more cooperative and that's the direction of travel that i think we both want to go in you know that like we'd like to see more democratic social enterprises and i'm sure social enterprises would like to see more cooperatives be more be clearer and more focused on on social impact and you know there's a huge amount of potential there we're all, all ultimately heading in the right direction i think compared to where the world could go in terms of you know the wrong direction alternatives no thank you james i think the democracy points a really interesting one i guess obviously lots of charities and social enterprise try to do it through that kind of using bo independent boards and governors but actually how does that then bring in the staff is always quite a different question so i think it's it's a really interesting way of looking at democracy within kind of community-led organizations um i'm conscious we've kind of got roughly five minutes left for questions so if you've got questions that you've popped up so there's been quite a lot in the chat so i could have missed something please just um repost it but i want to just um ask a, just a general question because people are kind of going in terms of finding networks or getting started in terms of going down the co-op route so someone said they're looking at a community worker co-op but finding the process of setting up quite difficult so how might people find other people in the same boat and where would you direct them to for support and um 
I'll ask from the practitioner point of view, because it, uh, James, I'm sure you'll obviously have some pointers on where they can go to for support. So I, I'd like to just ask um, first Lucinda and then Neil, just in terms of from a practitioner point of view, where would you advise people to go to if they're looking to set up a co-op? Um, I know Neil agrees with this because he said it before, that Co-ops UK is a very useful place to go. Um, then it depends on what your area of the economy is. Uh, Media Co-op belongs to a network of worker co-ops in the tech industry called Co-Tech. So I imagine, which I'd usually recommend if you're in that zone. So I imagine that other um, areas of endeavor have got their own sort of specialist groups. Thank you, Lucinda. Neil? Yeah, I mean, I, I, as, as Lucinda said, I said it in the presentation, which is Corpse UK, I, I mean, just to have so much information, but also, crucially, the, the kind of the, the legal sort of, um, you know, help desk or helpline, which was just really, really helpful when we said, look, this is what we're thinking about doing, and they were able just to point us in the right direction. So um, just, just found that uh, amazingly good but I, I think the, the, the people who are saying like you know we're interested in this but it is a little bit difficult again um, through the cross party group on coops we took a little bit of evidence about the co-op economy and some really really interesting you know people um, diff different businesses there's a couple from Glasgow and um, a, a sort of makers and um, cooperative looking at sort of arts and craft and getting people involved and, and basically they said the same thing which was look we, we had this in mind we wanted to do it but we didn't really know who to speak to and we did find it quite difficult. So, you know, look around, do a lot of research, try and find businesses that are operating in, in a reasonably sort of similar area. And I think go out and talk to them because, you know, our experience has been that, you know, we, we had contact with the, the guy from the Media Corp who, who were superb when we spoke to them, is that co-ops are, are really, really, try and be really, really helpful and, and will try and point you in, in the right direction. So it, it can be a bit daunting at first, I think, but once you make those, you know, individual contacts, then I think you'll, you'll find that people are, are incredibly helpful and, and want to, to help get you involved. Thank you. I mean, I, I know in my in my own experience, I've kind of touched on the edge of co-ops have generally worked much more in the social enterprise kind of space, but we have these tremendous ecosystems of support. And I, I would, listening in on the co-op movement and what both uh, Neil and Lucinda said, I think the co-op movement has a very similar approach in terms of strong ecosystems supporting each other and really making those connections, I think, to, in essence, create a better place in which and a better way of doing business i think when we're all aligned on that as an overall goal i think people are willing to help you in terms of that support so james i'm guessing you're going to give the obvious answer if people are looking for support um what would be the best way if they did want to contact co-ops uk to uh, do the best that? thing to do at this point i think would be if you're trying to set up a new co-op of any type um would be to go on uh, our website so that's uk.coop um there's a starter co-op page which can then can then direct you through to all the different types of uh, development support that we have on, on offer um, what's missing though I think is that really really early stage exploratory support um, so most of our business support programs um, for example where we'd pay to get access to a specialist business development advisor that type of thing you kind of need to be somewhere down the road in terms of having having your proto co-op in, in mind and who the founding members are and that type of thing there's a, there's a big gap in terms of support for that early exploratory work, particularly, I think, if you're looking at something like a hybrid part, which combines some workers and maybe some people in the community, the question of how you how you go out and engage with the community to find who might be interesting is, is a difficult one that I don't necessarily think we would immediately have the answer to unless you were doing something like a community share offer at the same time. And this is the big gap. This is the type of thing we'd love, for example, Scottish government uh, to perhaps um, to put more, put more resource into to, to provide some of this assistance on the ground in Scottish communities. No, thank you. I mean, certainly if you're going down the community shares right here in Scotland, we know that the support, but it's it's like you say, it's what's that point that gets you there in the first place, I guess, in terms of some of that very early stage. I'm conscious we're kind of at 12.30 and I just want to come maybe to a, a question that hopefully rounds off our session today, which is, you know, and I always like to finish on a positive. So what do you think, and I'll ask our three panellists to come in us, what do you think is the, the main benefit on a per, like a personal people level and perhaps on a business and commercial level around being a cooperative? And 
James, you're unmuted. So I'll, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Neil and then Lucinda. Sure. OK. Um, I think on a personal level, the best, the most important benefit that I've heard about and come across is definitely about well-being and the, the importance of empowerment and, and being part of the decisions that affect your life and your community and what have you is, is really, really important. So that just, yeah, the, the link between more economic democracy and, and well-being, I think, is, is absolutely crucial. Um, the crossover into the economic benefits, then I think, are obvious. You know, if you've got, if, if you have a, a business or an entity entity which is generating well-being, well, that's the whole point anyway. So, so that's you know, what, I don't know what, what measure of economic success which doesn't involve well-being um, isn't particularly relevant anyway. But you know, just a, like workforces which are more engaged, or an organisation which is able to respond to the needs of its community or its customers better because of because of that engagement in, in democratic governance, et cetera, I think is just, yeah, there are obvious benefits there. Thank you, James. That was really well put. You know, the, the fact of what is business actually there for in the first place is always quite interesting. Um, Neil and then Lucinda. Yeah, sorry, I'm just struggling to, to unmute there. But no, I think go, go back to my presentation. I think we, um, you know, the word in there, which is from the 19th century is well being. And I think that getting involved in the co op is good for your well being. And for all the reasons that, that James and, and, and others have, um, you know, have, have outlined, but I was going to say just a, a final point, because I'm, I'm going to have to, to go in a minute. But I also think a, a really, really key thing that we should all be striving towards is more diversity in life. So I think co-ops, social enterprises, the more and more choices that people have, the more diverse landscape that we can have in business and other and other aspects of life is all good. So um, maybe it's two points, but well-being and diversity. Thank you. I'm seeing a theme coming through, Lucinda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with the other panellists. And I think um, autonomy is the other thing I'd say. I think because we have the autonomy to run our business the way we want to, and we're the workers that do the work, and so we know what needs to be done, makes a huge amount of sense in terms of your happiness at work and business sense. Thank you. And, you know, I, th I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of how important well-being is. I think if if anything in the last 12, 15 months has shown us is that well-being is actually critical to us as communities and as individuals. So I, I think we've moved away from thinking that well-being is this fluffy scenario. It's not. It's absolutely critical. So I think finishing on that point of, of it being critical in terms of... <laughs> If we're not all well, what's what's the point? Well-being can have those economic benefits. Absolutely, I'd like to really thank our three panelists for joining us today. I, I actually thought today's discussion was fascinating in terms of um, some of the questions about democracy, about um, well-being. We've just touched on equality and pay. I mean, they're all surely some of the key questions we should all be asking as we're looking in terms of post-COVID recovery. So I think it was a really well-timed session and I, I can see in the chat that people have got a lot from it. So thank you for joining us. Um, I'm sure we'll be coming back to this as a topic again in the future based on the interest we've had today. So thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.